Good evening and thanks for tuning in. This is Political Forum for Wednesday, August 20th, 2014. We welcome today as our guest John Mulrow, the state senator from the 10th District. Senator Mulrow, thank you very much for joining us. Louis, it's great to be here. I'm Louis Mossos, a board member at CAN-TV. Political Forum is a live, interactive program brought to you as a public service by CAN-TV. We welcome your questions and comments for Senator Mulrow by calling us at 312-738-1060, the number at the bottom of your screen. Over the next 25 minutes, we'll do our best to get as many questions as we can on the air. I encourage you all to call the Senator and have an open and frank dialogue. So with that greeting, Senator, thanks for joining us. Uh, can you give us a brief overview of your district? All right, the district, it, it encompasses the northwest side of the city of Chicago, from down from the Portage Park area up to the Jefferson Park, the Edison Park, uh, it goes to the Belmont Harlem area, and then it um, goes into the surrounding suburbs. We've taken a little, little bit of Elmwood Park, a little bit of River Grove, a little bit of Franklin Park, and then moving north, we've taken all of Schiller Park, uh, most of Rosemont, all of Norwich, Harwood Heights, some of Des Plaines, Park Ridge, um, and some of Niles. Sounds like a very big district. Uh, do you have a newsletter or email list where all those residents can uh, stay in touch with what's going on? Yes, we do. We um, in, invite all of our, uh, the, our constituents and residents of the 10th district to contact us if they're not already on that. Um, we just recently sent out our newsletter uh, within the past week, so I hope you all received it. Uh, I noticed you also have a very active Facebook page. Uh, you mind sharing with our viewers some of the community events that you have coming up? Oh, we, yeah, we try our best. And what we've done recently is start start having satellite offices in all those uh, different areas or in the, the different suburbs. So uh, once a month we go out to the different suburbs, and for two to three hours we, we pick a, a library or whatever that is convenient for the um, the different suburb for us to have us there and so we can meet with the people and let them know what we're doing but more importantly I'm there to listen to what they have to say and their concerns and issues. In addition to that uh, we hold town halls uh, throughout the communities. We just had a senior driving fair this, uh, this morning. Uh, we have a back to school fair uh, Friday and the, the biggest uh, I guess fair or uh, event that we have is our uh, district fair that's at Dunham Park. Uh, that's a, a what we do there. Louis is invite uh, entities from the city, the state, the county, uh, the federal government, medical uh, entities. We also have fun activities for the kids, face painting, we have a jumping jack, and we have light food and refreshments for uh, people to come to Dunham Park. So instead of having to go to all these different agencies and seeing what they have to offer. We bring it all to the neighborhood. And we urge our viewers to go to your website that's on the screen as well as your Facebook page to view a list of those events. Uh, it's the summer break, you're not in session, but uh, in the uh, uh, legislative session that recently ended, can you tell us some of the committees you sat on and what were some of the interesting issues you saw there? I uh, currently serve on the Criminal Law Committee, um, the Judiciary Committee, the Insurance Committee, and I'm Chairman of the Public Health Committee. Uh, some of the major uh, items that came in front of the Public Health Committee and some of which I sponsored um, are the, one of them is the CPR AED bill. Uh, I was the sponsor of that bill in the House. Representative Dan Burke was in, I'm sorry, in the Senate. Representative Dan Burke was the uh, sponsor in the House. That bill came as a result of an 18 year old girl, Lauren Lehman, who was at drill practice and she suddenly collapsed. Um, there was an AED 40 feet away. Uh, the, the trainer or whoever the, the people there, the adults were there, uh, started doing CPR, uh, but never used the AD and she unfortunately passed away. Her father and mother came to us, um, asked if I would sponsor the vote or the, the bill in the Senate, and I was happy to do that. Uh, the bill got signed into law. A week after it got signed into law, uh, a, a young man, 17 year old in the Springfield area was at a shootout practice. He collapsed, the trainer was doing CPR, and I'm hopeful that this bill raised awareness for the AD, shouted to, to the nearby whoever was there to go get the AD, used the AD on this individual, the 17-year-old, and brought him back to life. What this bill does as part of health class in high school is to teach uh, our children, our future lifesavers, to, to how to administer CPR and to use the AD machine. 
It's a very important bill statewide. Thanks yes. for sponsoring that. No, absolutely. I'm told we have a caller on the line. Uh, hello, caller. You're on with Senator Mulro. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, I read recently that Governor Quinn signed a House bill into law that was co-sponsored by the state senator. I wanted to ask what his thoughts were about uh, nicot- alternative nicotine products and how they're being advertised. That's a very good, good question. Thank you very much for the, the call. Last session, I actually sponsored a bill that um, prohibited the sale of these e-cigarettes, and they're, they're relatively new invention and people use them to try to quit smoking uh, but we don't want our our children to be using them because they're they have nicotine in them so we don't want you know we, we the law prohibited the sale to anyone under 18 this year uh, in addition to that bill we we want the the e-cigarettes to be sold behind the counter where the other products or nicotine or cigarettes are are sold in addition to that bill there's uh, these refillable e-cigarettes, and they come in little vials, sort of like an eyedropper, and you you can actually screw the top off and to refill your e-cigarette compared to the, the ones that are self-contained that you throw away when you're done. Well, these containers that you can easily take, you know, uh, twist off the top are labeled bubblegum, grape, uh, and all these flavorful and colorful uh, liquids. But on the back of one of the containers, I saw is poison. So it made sense to me that we should actually uh, require safety tops or child-proof tops on those containers so little five-year-olds that can't read and makes it look like gum uh, to try to ingest it. Because if you put this nicotine in the liquid form on your skin, it'll burn your skin. And I'm just um, very fearful what it would do to a young child who ingests it. Thank you for your question, caller. And I think that uh, legislation goes hand in hand with what uh, you voted on several years ago to uh, ban uh, flavored blunt wraps. Same thing, those are being marketed to kids as cotton candy and grape. So Correct. it seems like it never ends. Yeah, and I, I, one other comment on that. You know, I, I'm all for people stopping uh, to, to stop smoking. And if that's, that e cigarette can be used for adults to stop smoking, I'm all for that. I just don't want them to get it into the hands of children. Uh, we have another. Caller on the line. Hello, caller. Uh, what's your question for Senator Mulro? Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, one question is concerning the uh, new legislation that will uh, prohibit uh, smoking at state universities, I believe, next year. This just passed uh, by Governor Quinn. Um, does this also include those e-cigarettes and alternative uh, uh, smoking um, products? I do not believe so. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's for smoking. And the whole idea, and since I've been in the General Assembly for four years, is to try to to help people or encourage people to stop smoking cigarettes. The long-term effects are obvious and uh, leads to earlier deaths, cancers, and very costly as well. Uh, As far as I'm aware, but I'd have to get back to you um, on the detail, but as far as I know, it just limits it to cigarettes. Thank you for your question, caller. Uh, While we're on the topic, medicinal marijuana is also a very timely topic uh, statewide. There was a town hall meeting at Northeastern University today, and I believe that came before your committee as well. Yes. So we passed last year medicinal medicinal marijuana for certain really um, uh, illnesses that were, you know, muscular sclerosis, cancer, only for those those um, illnesses that were very severe. This year, um, that came before the public health committee was medicinal marijuana for children with um, with a for with ep- epilepsy and that have seizures, you know, 300 times a day. Uh, The room was packed when they came in. Parents came with their children in in wheelchairs. These were severely disabled kids that were suffering seizures for at 300 times a day. There's, Colorado allows this medicinal marijuana for children. It's not in a smoking form. It's an oil that gets put on their tongue. They couldn't couldn't hold a a marijuana cigarette if they tried. Uh, The idea behind the bill, which was to relieve some of the seizures. It, it's not going to eliminate the seizures, but it will reduce the amount of seizures, which will help that, that young child and, and not, not only the child, but the family from the stress that it causes on them from watching their kid go through uh, all those seizures. I'd like to remind everyone you're watching Political Forum, a uh, community service of Can TV. I'm Louis Mosos, a board member uh, at Can TV. I'd like to urge everyone to call us at 312-738-1060 and get your questions to Senator Mulroe. Uh, Senator, uh, 
pension reform seemed to have been a big issue in the legislature. Uh, Illinois Supreme Court recently struck down a portion of that, and it seems like they're poised to strike down the entire pension reform bill as unconstitutional. Uh, I guess that means the state is going to need some new revenues. With that in mind, what are some of the some of the things that you've been hearing or that you think the legislature will have to do to get some new revenues to make up for the shortfall? You know, before I, I get into that, Louie, I just... You know, our, our pensions have been neglected and, and the funding of them have been neglected for 20 years, 30 years. If everyone would have done their part way back when and put a little more in from the employee perspective or the, or the, the state or the city entity, uh, we wouldn't be talking about this. So the, there's no dispute that um, all the state pension funds and the city pension funds are severely underfunded. Um, the, the bill that you were referring to actually dealt with health care. State employees um, had re would receive free health care. Uh, that was putting severe pressure on our budget. Uh, we thought it was more equitable to say, hey, we're not taking away health care. Uh, but if you're depending on what you make, there'd be a sliding scale on the premium just to try to, to provide a, a more sustainable uh, method to keep people uh, getting health care. That one was actually, it was found unconstitutional. The, the Supreme Court found that health care was considered similar to a retirement benefit, and our Constitution says that those benefits cannot be diminished or impaired. So with that said, uh, we are going to have to still struggle with that issue. It's a, a really important issue. Uh, it's providing extreme pressure on the budget. Um, it's at probably 20, about 20 cents on a dollar. Uh, goes towards paying pensions. And what I want to see is that to make sure those systems are sustainable but also affordable, people were promised a, a pension. They, were, they put in what they promised, but we're still underfunded. So we still have this mess that we have to take care of. So I'm going to do my best to try to solve it and uh, within a reasonable fashion. Some of the ideas that, you know, for, that have come up for revenue with, you know, not, you know, with regard to income taxes are let's look at other sources. We've, we've made cuts over the last four years I've been there, and I should mention that we've made our pension payment every year since I've been there, and that was not the case in the prior years that I was there, and that led to more underfunding. Um, but there are some uh, things that we've done by cutting expenses, Medicaid reform, we've uh, reformed our workers' comp system to try to get this, this in uh, our momentum going in the right direction. Some of the ideas that are on the table currently for additional revenue, fracking, that bill was passed uh, a year ago. It's currently in the rules and, and, uh, and how to restrict or uh, regulate that, that industry. Uh, that's supposed to bring in a lot more money, and hopefully it does. And um, there's always gambling, um, expanding gambling uh, to certain areas within the state. That's been on the, the table every year that I've been there, with the exception of last year. And the idea being people who are gambling, they're going to gamble. Uh, we currently have many people in Illinois going to Indiana or Wisconsin, and they gamble there. Uh, we're not telling them they gamble, but they do there, and they spend their money there. But then if there's ill effects, and we all realize there are, they come back, and we have to take care of them, the, those ill effects. Um, there's some issue about expanding the sales base, uh, sales tax base. Uh, so these are all items that are on the table. Um, there's a millionaire's tax that's going to be an advisory referendum on the November ballot. And the idea of that is whatever the regular taxes, uh, we're all going to pay. But if your income exceeds a million dollars, there'll be a surcha surcharge on that excess of whatever percentage. I think it was 3%. Um, and the last thing that's been talked about is the progressive income tax. Uh, right now, our Constitution requires a flat tax. In order to get a progressive income tax, we'd have to change the Constitution, which would require not a simple majority, but a super majority or 60% in the in the um, both chambers. And the idea behind a progressive tax is similar to the, the way we get taxed on our federal income. It's a progressive, so it's a layered tax. If you're on a lower le level, you get a certain percentage. As you increase, the additional layer is taxed at a higher level, not the entire amount. So one level might be taxed at 1%, say 0 to 10,000. From 10,000 to 20 might be 2%, and so forth. So that's another issue that's it's still being debated, but we're looking at, at all the options that are available to right the ship.
because right now we are we are struggling. It's a very challenging time down there. Um, we have paid down our old bills uh, a great amount uh, since I've been there, um, but we are in a we're tough water. I guess your background as an accountant probably does come in handy when we're talking about taxes and revenues. It is, you know it does, and I, don't know, I think there may be only other one other CPA on the on the Senate floor. How many in the House? But you know percentages. You know there there's big numbers: thirty five, thirty six billion dollars, and what percentage goes to pay pensions? What percentage goes to education? What go, percentage to, goes to take care of our elderly, our developmentally disabled, and our mentally ill? So it's I'm comfortable with numbers, and uh, I'm happy to engage in any conversations regarding that. Uh, we have a caller on the line. Hello, caller. You're on the air with Senator Morrell. Hey, I saw that your district was out by the airport, and uh, I've got some friends that live out there, and I know a lot of people are kind of upset about the changing flight patterns at O'Hare. Is that an issue you're dealing with at all? And like, if so, sort of where does that stand right now? That Thank you for the call. That is a major issue on the northwest side of Chicago and the surrounding suburbs that are affected. So to give you an idea briefly, the um, the runways used to be, going east and west and they'd be going diagonally north and south uh, i don't know 10 years ago whenever this project started they thought it would be more efficient for the the airlines to come in if they all went in one direction so the runways being parallel to each other all going east and west uh, that has caused more flights to come over certain people that are um, east or west of the airport and generally the flights are coming in and taking off from on the you know west of the airport uh, there's also descending patterns that have, instead of going as close to the airport and then go down, they're starting to step down, which is creating more noise that, that are affecting the, the people of the, the 10th district. I've sponsored two resolutions in the last two years, so try to get ahead of this, uh, to make the FAA address uh, the concerns of the, the, my constituents. Uh, there has been soundproofing on the northwest side, and that was based on a calculation or uh, you know, information that they had and they set a, a boundary lines or contours of who would be eligible for that. We recently found out some of the data they used was inaccurate. So what I've done, and I've, I've called the congressman's office, I met with Senator U.S. Senator Dick Durbin uh, to let him know that this is a major, major concern on the Northwest side, uh, that we maybe we should bring back the diagonal. We're not going to get rid of O'Hare. It's a it's a economic engine for our, our state and city, but we want to try to make sure the quality of life of the residents of the 10th district and anybody else affected uh, is increased. So we can try to spread out the flights, make sure all the runways are used, maybe bring back some of the diagonals um, to redraw those boundary lines to give people more relief that are affected by the noise. But I also think the the one thing that and I saw actually recently, I think Argon, some, some uh, inventor, is to try to minimize the noise and muffle, muffle the sound of the engine, similar to muffling the sound of a car. And um, I did talk to the airlines as well. Uh, it's obviously expensive, but it's something that they need to do. They're, they're benefiting from, you know, obviously the airport, but they have to take into account the, um, the people that live underneath the air or nearby the airport. Thank you for your question, caller. Uh, you're watching Political Forum, a community service of Can TV. I'm Louis Mososa, board member at Can TV, uh, and we urge you, if you have a question, feel free to call us at 312-738-1060 to ask your question for Senator Mulroll. Uh With that, I believe we have another caller on the line. Hello, caller. Hello. What's, what's your question? Yes. Hello, uh, Bruce Randazzer. I got a couple questions for you. Maybe you can answer. Sure. Go ahead. Oh. Okay. The first question is. How come the city workers don't get enough protection like the state workers? Say, like they're, they're standing on the uh, expressway directing traffic, whether it's on the uh, side streets. But the city workers don't, don't have that advantage. I wonder if there's going to be anything passed uh, to help the city workers. That's always a possibility, Bruce. Thanks for your call. Um, I recently actually sponsored a bill, and you're talking about some state employees that are on the highway, but the actual tollway uh, workers did not have the same protections. And recently we had a, a member of our tollway, an employee of the tollway, actually die as a result. So it depends on the color of the lights and who has to, you know, we have these 
you know, laws that, hey, if you're coming up on an emergency vehicle, you should move to your left. A lot of it makes common sense, Bruce. That would be uh, something that, you know, I'll, I'll be, bring back to uh, my, my alderman to see um, what we can do to protect the employees because people just have to slow down and, and be more respectful of others. And, and obviously, you know, somebody working on the streets, they're, they're, they're left out there without any protection. So I, there should be. Thank you for your question, Bruce. Uh, we spoke about the airport. What are some of the other issues that uh, you hear now that it's uh, you're over the summer break and you're home in the district a lot? Uh, what are some of the other issues affecting residents? Well, you know, I mean, we're we're constantly helping, you know, seniors with their needs, whether it's from, you know, we actually hold outreaches for uh, tax appeals, and you know, seniors are obvious on a on a you know budget where. Their income doesn't change month to month, and when taxes go up, we try to make sure everyone, you know, pays their fair taxes. So we have, you know, a tax um, appeals where we invite the Cook County Board of Review out to the the district and try to to ensure that people are just paying their fair share and not any more than than they should. Um, there's various things that we, you know, we try to help um, our constituents whatever their needs are. Uh, minimum wage is another timely issue. I believe there's going to be a uh, advisory question on the next ballot. I think the city uh, recently has been looking at that. Is that an issue that's been coming up? Yeah, that you're. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out too, Louis. So, just so everyone knows, there's an advisory uh, referendum on the November ballot, and it asks whether you you think that the minimum wage should be increased from to ten dollars. Right now, it's on a federal level. It's seven and a quarter. The state of Illinois is eight and a quarter. That's a big issue, and I truthfully, my opinion is that eight and a quarter is not a living wage. I also understand the pressures and strains that it's going to put on businesses, and the last thing I wanted to do is actually have people lose their job as a result. There's all this balancing going out, and, a, and it's a conversation that is continuing. The business interests down in, uh, in Springfield also recognize, in my opinion, that eight and a quarter is too low. And we have to bring people within uh, a range that they can raise themselves, let alone their family. And if they're receiving minimum wage right now, they're actually getting subsidies from the the state because they're they're living in poverty. Uh, for our viewers who might not be inclined to get involved or contact their local legislator if they have an issue, what would you what would you say to them? Absolutely, call. You know, I, I tell you, I. In never in my wildest dreams that I think I would be an Illinois state senator. You know, four years ago I got asked to consider it, and I, I uh, hesitated because I was not familiar with Springfield and what I heard was bad. But what I found is you have to get involved. I did. I took that risk. Um, I sacrificed, you know, my family's time, but I also I think it's going to benefit my family. I have four children. I want their future to be better uh, than what we have today. Um, call us. We're just just like you. We're members of the community. We want to hear from you because that's the only, we don't obviously aren't experts in everything. We want to hear from you, address your concerns, and help uh, in situations that we can. And like you said, you set up multiple satellite offices to make sure the residents are getting the services that they need. Yeah, and we're trying to, you know, so we, the district is very big, but we're trying to set up, you know, set up these satellite offices so we can come to you and listen to you and then try to address your concerns. So I just encourage you to call uh, your representatives. So I, my two representatives are Rob Martwick and Mike McAuliffe. Um, so we live in the 10th Senate District, and they are the 19th and 20th State Rep District. Uh, both good guys, and I'm willing to listen to you and try to do the best for you, because we're here to serve you, and it's my privilege and honor to do that. And I see we're out of time. Are there any final comments you'd like to make, Senator? No, I, I just, it, I'll tell you, the open dialogue, open communication with the constituents and the residents of the 10th district, that's how I do my job better. I'm here to serve you. Uh, it's my pleasure, and it's been, a, you know, so far a fascinating experience. Obviously, we're, we're living in a very challenging time, um, but I'm up for the challenge. Once again, if you'd like to reach Senator Moroda's office, please call 773-763-3810. Uh, Senator Moreau, thank you for appearing on Political Forum. And thank you, the viewers, for your calls. Our telephone technician has been Omari today. Political Forum is brought to you as a community service by CAN-TV. Please join us for Political Forum again next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Lee.